Hi pod fans, I hope you're well. Thank you very much for joining us again at the Total Water Polo podcast. We've got an incredible guest today, I'm really excited. Um, I mean, if you're trying to list off two or three of the best players in the world uh, in the 21st century, it's pretty hard to look past our guest today. He's a serial winner, he's so decorated, he's won dozens of titles everywhere he's gone. He's won three Champions Leagues with three different clubs and he's even played at the Olympics twice for two different teams. Uh, it's Felipe Perone. But just before we start, just two things. Firstly, if you haven't had the opportunity to go and listen to our first podcast with Maddie Musselman, I do recommend that. She's amazing, really insightful. Wherever you found this podcast, that will be available. And secondly, thanks to our sponsors today, Wear Water Polo. If you want 10% off your next order, use our discount code PODCAST10. So that's PODCAST10. Head over to the site, see if there's any stash that you like the look of or even contact us if we can do anything for team kit or branding. Just drop us an email and we'll sort you out. But anyway, let's get on with the podcast. It's Felipe Peroni. Hello, Felipe. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, James. How are you? You well? Great, great. Very happy to be here. Good. Good, good. It's an absolute honour to uh, to speak to you, um, and I'm sure all our listeners are really excited to hear what you've got to say. Um, have you been training today? You've been out and about this morning. Yeah, of course, of course. Like, I'm always like, I'm, I, we always tell like we are not like soccer players that just do a little bit of training. We train a lot, so <laughs> of course I was in session. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, I mean. Just this season with Barcelona, you can tell you've been training. I mean, you've won all 15 games. Um, obviously, the club has won, you know, a lot of titles in the last 15. They've won them all. Um, in fact, you were in the last team that wasn't Barcelona to, to win. Is that is that correct with Barcelona? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We beat uh, Sabadell yeah. in the final. So, yeah. like, it was the King's Cup. It was great. and uh, But, like, you know, like, Mario Polo, it doesn't matter like if you are playing too many games you are training too yeah. so this is our our life yeah. and this it, is like and it, it looks it looks like you you look good to, to to maybe win the league again are you enjoying the polo is the squad all, all as one with elvis you know the new coach is everyone harmonious and happy at the moment yeah yeah it's a, like a different different way of course we were with uh, choose martin a lot of years it was great we have he's amazing coach but this change with Elvis it brings us like different way of playing, different way of training, and it's always like a, a beautiful and nice uh, goal to reach. Um, so we are really enjoying. We are trying to adapt. I think we are playing every month better. But it's a long season, and and we have like next game is the most important. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> we need to to just like try to to play the best as fast as we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... Just, just, just a question on on the league this season. Do you do you think the Spanish league is competitive enough at the top? I mean, I've said you've you've played fifteen, you've won fifteen. Obviously, the first match, today, yeah. you know, it was a bit close with Sabado, and then you, you beat them. Uh, actually, I think it, it's true. It's a problem. Like um, um, in Spain this year, uh, for example, Sabado and Barcelona, they were really investing and they're trying to beat us, which is great for the sport. <laughs> But um, it's true that in Spain, when it, when it was the, the GMC, the, the great uh, GFC, sorry, the great financial crisis on 2008, uh, the war polo suffered a lot. So we were, it's not that it was never a professional, but it was like many teams were paying and they're trying to do more professional. And after the, the great crisis, um, many Teams come like very amateur, so it's it's complicated because you have a couple of three teams, two three teams which are professional and others are amateur, so it's uh, it's difficult. But anyway, I think uh, it's that the point that Barcelona and Sabadell were playing the semifinals in Lang Cup, it shows that they are trying to to reach us and they are investing, and this is good for our sport. Yeah, yeah, they had a really good result last week in Europe. Um, also, I need to say congratulations for the Copa del Rey last week. Was it the the uh, the Kings Cup last yeah. week? It's a good good victory. Um, speaking of competition and professional clubs, uh, I guess we've got to talk about the Champions League. We've got a really big game coming up in in a few weeks. I have I have got a que- we have got a question. I, I won't deal with it now, but 
there's been maybe some suggestion that Barcelona have been struggling in the Champions League. Um, I think perhaps it's a little bit harsh, bearing in mind you've you've played a lot of away games and you've you've drawn against some really good teams. And I mean that group's really really tough. Um, uh, but you know what? Wh- why do you think? Uh, well, what do you think you need to do really to ensure that you are in that that final eight? Um, you've got some great games coming up. Yeah, for us, for us, it was a pretty difficult season. Uh, Alberto Monares, which was one of our main players, he was injured almost like four months, and then I think last two months we were almost not training together due to the COVID. May, probably all the team got the COVID, so and we were like following the rules in Spain, so we were not able to training. But we never used that like an excuse. I think every team in the world have had that problem. So, but it's a it's a point, and it's a thing that we we were were struggling, and now I think we are playing better. And uh, but it was it was not an easy an easy uh, season. And of course, there is a, a um, it's normal. We have three four months. To adapt to the new system of playing, new system of training sessions. So, but I think we are. I feel that we are in a good way. And uh, and uh, as I said before, it's a long season. It's a very important the next game, but it's a long season. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, ho- hopefully, hopefully you guys you guys can make it. You've obviously played in a number of Champions Leagues. Um, you know, nearly two decades worth. Uh, do, do you? Obviously, it's uh, <laughs> not like it's old or anything. But, um, uh, do, do you feel that the Champions League has come uh, has progressed a long way? Obviously, there's lots of th- lots of uh, problems, and it's problematic. Some of the Champions League stuff, you know, sometimes out of the pool rather than in the pool. But do you think, on the whole, the brand, the competition has 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 been raised, or do you actually feel we've kind of taken a step backwards? You know, it's like for me, it's very difficult to to analyze that, like. I don't know if this happened to you too, James, but what was when we look back was better. So, <laughs> and sometimes I saw some games and I, I like, I felt that War Polo was better before. And I, I saw the games, I said, well, no, it's very slow. It's not so fast. So it's difficult really to analyze. But I think the Champions League were more professional before. There were more teams like the Italian League. There were more investment in Italy, more investment in many countries. And this is, of course, it's, it's a problem to our sport, but uh, I think that it's like a, the event of final eight. There is a, a lot of discussion about that too, but sometimes it was good. Sometimes it was not so good. It's, it's really tough to, to analyze because our perspective, it's not, never like, so we have always a, a bias about the, everything before was better. So, but anyway, I think the point is that, uh, it's our sport. We always have that d- difficult to, to make it a business and to make this uh, uh, more, you know, like to think about in a marketing way, to think about in, in um, like, um, like other sports. And this is something that we, for sure, we need to improve a lot. Um, those Champions League nights, though, what was it like, you know, going away to Hungary or even just hosting it in in Barcelona or going to Serbia, you know, you've got a few hundred people in the crowd, you've got a really big game. What What's it like when you're lining up, you're listening to the music? Um, can you, you know, explain what that's like? I still enjoy this like a kid, you know. Um, you probably know my story. I came from Brazil, which is where Paulo is like almost nothing. <laughs> and uh, so when you get to these kind of games during the year, it's something so special because... Um, I think we're training a lot. Our polo players, we are like training twice a day. It's a hard sport. We, and the, but that moment when you before the game, when you feel the the crowd, when you are enjoying to play, it like <laughs> it's justify everything. So uh, the Champions League games, of course, not every single game is like that. But for us, we are not used to play with such a beautiful crowd so when it when it get this time it's it's so so special and it's beautiful because on this like you said before 20 years i was always living this and always new players were coming and i can feel like they how they 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 are happy and how they enjoy these moments which like when you when you live this as a athlete and when it's over you will never leave it you never have this experience again so it's something 
very, very special and beautiful from Mario yeah, Sport. It definitely makes it all worthwhile. Um, you, you, said, uh, you said perhaps jokingly that um, when you look back, maybe things were better in the past. Well, just talk a bit about your club career. And Jesus, it's ma- massively impressive. I mean, uh, I've got a long bit of paper here. That, you know, Barcelona, two championships. Barcelona, 11. Pro Reco, Champions League, two division, uh, championships, Super Cup. Jürg, you've won Champions League and the Super Cup. Um, obviously, very different clubs, um, different countries, and you've obviously won three Champions Leagues with three of them. How how do you, when you sometimes sit maybe out looking out on the beach or walking the dog or something, how do you compare your experiences at the clubs that, that you've been at? If you can maybe go through them a little bit, starting with Barcelona. Yeah, it, it is another, like, a very advantage of our sport and it's beautiful about the sports life i was able to know many cultures not just in water polo but out of the swimming pool so it was a privilege for me uh of course if i go like thinking very fast um for example barceloneta when i arrived it was another club it's not they were i think they were never been in the in the final four before so it was club that was starting and it was the beginning of a project which was 2006 or something like that and um, I was in Savona which was my I was 21 years old and I was trying just to see how was the Italian league on that moment which were the best league in the world and the small city but much more professional much more pressure on the games and it was beautiful uh, experience after that I'm like we were already joking like that it's like uh, some guy on TV said, like, that I'm always like the Netflix show I want, or series. I'm always coming back to Barcelona, to Barceloneta. So first season in Barceloneta, second season in Barceloneta. So I'm always going out and then coming back to Barceloneta. But um, after that, coming back to Barceloneta, I went to Proreco, which was playing with the best players in history, like Tomas Kachas. Uh, Filip Filipovic was like, I think on that moment was maybe one of the best teams in the history, maybe uh, like it was completely amazing. And come back to Barcelona again, third season of the TV show. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then uh, I went to Jug Dubrovnik, which was one of the most beautiful experiences I ever had in my life. Uh, with like, the team, like how was the team to work with uh, Vieko Kobeshak? How was like like the city? How was living that moment? Like Dubrovnik, like they how they feel the sport, how they they follow war polo. This is for me was like I love war polo, and this was the best place to be, you know. And of course, to know the culture too, which was very interesting. It's amazing the Dubrovnik. How are how is the story of this city? After that, I come back again to to Barcelona, <laughs> fourth season. That's definitely a trend. That's definitely a trend. <laughs> and uh, and in Barcelona again, like it was completely different because, as I said before, two thousand six, we were trying to win the league, and now the 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 goal was to to won the the final eight. So this is like different way of leave the club. You 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 did speak there, and it was it was beautiful to hear it. And I, I have got some notes here about it. You, you talked about Jug. Uh, I feel like that probably has quite a special place in your heart, not just in the pool. I believe you met your wife there, your current wife while you were there. Um, You know, from just from some of the interactions I've seen, some of the the messages we've had from, uh, you know, we've we've got a question from Vieco and and others. Um, How how special is that club for you? Uh, Like, how can I, it's like, I think... Um, for you, James, from England, probably you can understand that when you love this sport, you will try to be in the place where people love this sport too. So, and when you see that everybody is loving this sport and putting energy and talking about the games, you go to a coffee and then someone tells you, "Why? Why didn't you shoot this ball? Why didn't do that? Why?" It's so nice, like to live this experience. I remember that some guys were telling me, no, it's a lot of pressure. I said, not pressure. This is the most beautiful that people really interesting about the sport. And, uh, but of course, I just leave the good part of that because in two years, we won every single tournament. We just lost the final of Champions League on the second year. So my experience was amazing there. <laughs> so it was two perfect years. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an experience there. It's... And of course, not just the world polo, but 
out of the swimming pool and this was really really really, really special to me good that's uh, maybe it's a bit unfair for me to ask which which Champions League of the three that you won which one do you think is is your favorite or the most memorable every has his story of course I think with um, with Reco it was to play with this amazing team with these superstars this was great uh, Barcelona was like the project which start I was in 2006 was the beginning of this project and then we won in, in Barcelona it's like to it's like a movie you know <laughs> like we were eight years I ten years I just come back and and we come back again to Barcelona and we won the Champions League so it was beautiful too but in Dubrovnik I had a story which was for me more sensitive more I felt like more my my uh, it's a different feeling because my my friends from brazil that was when i started to play i was maybe seven eight years old and they were playing with me there in a like a poor cl club which in water polo is nothing <laughs> so they were there with me and they were always following my career and then on the champions league in, in budapest which we won with Jürgen dubrovnik they came to see the the final and many of them was never out of brazil so they were like getting money to do this travel and they, they were there on the crowd you know and they make like a huge flag with my name and it so it was amazing that feeling that we, like they came first time in europe many of them first time in europe they came to see the finals we won i was the mvp so it was like whoa <laughs> it's so so special everything went to plan um just just one thing before we move on to maybe uh, how you got into the sport and then your international career. You, you, you spoke about Pro Reco walking into like a team of stars. Now, water polo is it's maybe not like other sports, you know, football. I was compared to football, but, you know, in football, you've got hundreds and hundreds of players and you won't play against many of them ever because they'll be in different leagues. They won't play in Champions League or something. But when, you, when you're a top water polo player, and you're playing international and club, you come across the same players quite often, um, you know, whether it's Euros, whether it's World Champs, yeah. Olympics. And so a lot of the players that you've played with, not just at Reco, but elsewhere, have also been big enemies in a way, you know, thinking of the Serbians, you know, you know, recent games with them have been really heartbreaking for the Spanish team and stuff. But, but how close are you all, um, particularly at Reco, when you had such a variety of nationalities there? Uh, do you do you actually get on really really well or you know is, do you have to compartmentalize okay well I'm now your teammate but next week when we're playing world league I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that you don't get anything past me hmm. I think this is a, a very nice and beautiful like um, characteristic of our community uh, we play like I think of course we have sometimes they are your teammates sometimes you play against them but we were, I think, as a community, we're a poly community. We were, because we, we were able to always uh, be good friends out of the swimming pool. And then when you play, you just forget about it, you know. And this is, I think, it's a, as I said before, it's a beautiful characteristic. Uh, it's, I think, water polo gives you such a, it, it's a sport, which you, I always tell like, so, so many people, like when you were playing soccer maybe Messi will get the ball and we go alone and score or we play like or basketball Michael Jordan we get the ball and we go or LeBron James and go and make the, the score but make the basket but in water polo you need your teammates so the connection the relationships you 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 create in water polo it's so strong that of course when you go out of the swimming pool it's impossible that that you broke that you no know? so you, you we keep these relations and uh I think it's a it's a beautiful characteristic of yeah. our sport. Yeah, that's, that's lovely to hear. Honestly, I, I could hear you just talk about that all day. Uh, I guess we we should go back to where it all started. Um, some people don't know, but you obviously were born in Brazil, in Rio. Yeah. Um, you were brought up in a bit of a water polo family. Your your dad used to play. Ricardo is is that correct? And you yeah, you have exactly. an older brother who's a few years older. Uh, what was it? Nine nine or ten years older. Um, Kiko. Yeah. Yeah, okay, exactly. so, you know, you're brought up in Rio, and my understanding of, you know, it's not very strong of Brazilian water polo, but a lot of the water polo is concentrated in Rio or Sao Paulo, a bit like it is in Spain with uh, in Catalonia. 
Um, what was your what was your experience with water polo? You know, growing up from quite a young age. Yeah, it's it's funny, like because everybody was always when you said that you were Brazilian, they expected you to play soccer. No, it's yeah, like yeah. normal. Once they will play water polo, we're from Brazil. It's like everybody said it's crazy combination. But actually, my my father was a water polo player, and my brother, and of course, I was there on the, on our club just. They said, no, no, my father always said to me, no, I, I never I never make any pressure that you play war polo, but he lived me at the club, you know, all the day. So I was there, I had nothing to do. I was in the swimming pool, like playing with the ball. And then I said, oh, actually, I got love war polo too. So, <laughs> but uh, this was like how I, I, I started war polo. And, uh, and of course, my brother and my, and my father, they were like a mentors to me. So I was always, they were always helping me and trying to, to create a culture of train, um, training, and they were very, very important on, on this beginning. And uh, and another guy that was very, very important was my first coach, is Angelo Coelho. And uh, since there, he always, every every single year, he came to Europe to see me, to see my games. And of course, they, he was there in, in, in Budapest when we won the Champions League. So they are they were the important persons that helped me to, to play and wear polo. Okay, well, big big shout out to Angelo. I think we in the water polo world, we are, we are a lot of uh, if he helped you get where you are. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I guess we we need to talk we need to talk about your transition um, from Brazil to Spain. You you arrived in Spain when you were fifteen. Is, is that is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Um, why why did you move? If if you don't mind saying, it's not too personal. Why did you no, move to Spain? Was it was it was it water polo or was it? A family thing, and did you move with your brother and your parents, or was it just you on your own? Like uh, it was a word polo, my dream, <laughs> my dream wow. to play word polo. Uh, we were when I was young, I was playing word polo with my brother at home. Like we were trying to make the couch as the one goal, <laughs> and so when we were always playing, like we we have like teams, and he was. It was a fight who would be going to be Spain because we loved Spain on that moment, 96, that they won the Olympic Games, they won the World Championship. And they were not never tall guys, they are small guys. So we were very identified. And my grandmother was from Spain too, so we were very identified with the Spanish war polo. And after Fukuoka in 2001, I was playing there with Brazil and my brother too. Uh, Ivan Perez, the Cuban center forward, helped my brother to go to play in Spain. So my brother moved to to Barcelona, and I I start to come here to and moved with with him. So do you owe a lot to Ivan? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just thinking if there's if there's anyone in Europe or Brazil or South America, or, you know, that that wants to make that transition, you know, um, it's a big commitment. You know, giving up things, moving, yeah. you know, a few thousand miles. Definitely. You Absolutely, know, what yeah. what what word of advice would you give to them? Yeah, actually, when I look back, it's a bit, <laughs> I said, like, it's crazy because when I see someone with 15, 16, 16 years old going to Europe because of war polo, it's like, <laughs> it's a big, big risk, but um, it was good. <laughs> it is a, it was amazing experience. Uh, but my advice, I think, like, war polo opens a lot of doors and, and you can, it's we are a small community, but we are really really connected. As I said before, the how our sport it is. So I think it's it's an advantage and it's opportunity. Maybe when you move to somewhere else, that you go to play water polo, and uh, and not just because of the sport, but the connections that everybody helps each other. So it's a it's a great uh, it's a great way to move away from your country. Yeah, yeah totally agree. Um... So you were 15 and you played at your World Cup in 2001 in Japan. Um, and then you transitioned and then played with Spain from 2005. 2005, Sorry. I played in Montreal. And so what what was it like going from... You said you have a Spanish grandmother. Yeah. Um, did you feel a bit of pressure from people, uh, you know, when you decided, OK, look, and now I'm going to play for Spain? Or, or did, was it an easy decision because there was nothing... It was it was a little bit of pressure because there is these things about nationality, nationalism and uh, sport, which is a little bit... There is many ways to see that, but actually the feeling that I had on that moment is that 
I was not representing Brazil. Like <laughs> Brazilian water polo at that time was like very, very amateur. So when we were playing, no one knows that we were playing. And uh, and my dream were big to play Olympic Games, to try to win the World Championship, the European Championship. So the only way to to keep to reach my goals and to to be professional and to to leave this sport was moving to Spain. As I said before, we've had this connection at home. Um, my, my grandmother was from Catalonia, and she moved to, to Brazil in the, in the, after the Civil War in Spain. So for me, it was not, not a big deal. Yeah, uh, you know, you, you've said that, okay, well, no one in Brazil, you know, there's not really much there. That all changes when Brazil get awarded the Olympic Games. Yeah. Um, now, this is, you know, I don't think it defines you at all as, you know, you've had an outstanding career, but... This is the one thing that I've always wanted to ask you. Um, when Brazil, it was announced that Brazil would be getting the Olympics, did was that when the seed was planted in your head, thinking, oh, I'd, I'd actually quite like to play for Brazil? Or was it slightly later? I, I think a lot of people would be interested to hear how it came about that you would you would eventually represent Brazil in Rio. This was maybe the most difficult decision. <laughs> it was even more, more, much more difficult than the first one to move from Brazil to Spain. Uh, I think the water polo rules allow this, which is like another discussion if it's okay or not. But I was always feeling like I came to Spain at 15 years old. I was born in Brazil. My family is from Brazil. So I was all, always half and half. And uh, so when the Olympic Games was in Rio, which is my city, I said, oh, it will, be, it will come the time to make big decisions. No? And uh, on that moment, I really have that feeling that uh, Olympic Games... Of course, I would like to have a medal, and uh, of course, I want to gold medal in Olympic Games. But when you were talking about an undeveloped country like Brazil, when you speak about Olympic Games, it's an opportunity to make people to know the sport, to play water polo. And in Brazil, was happening many social projects, uh, like to, to make the people to play water polo. So I said I, f I felt that like responsibility, and that I need to 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 represent Brazil. I need to help these projects and I need to help all these people in Brazil which struggle to make water polo as, um, a better sport in Brazil and the Olympic Games was that like chance to make more famous and to to help to, to improve the water polo in Brazil. Yeah, I mean that, that's a really admirable uh, kind of stance to take. I assume you could have played for Spain at that Olympic Games, is that right? Yeah. So I mean that that's quite a brave decision because yeah you know I yeah. mean, you weren't the only you weren't the only I say in quotations because you are you were born in Brazil but there was a massive mix of players in that team you know we had Josip Vrilic from yeah. Croatia um, Ives Gonzalez from Cuba uh, the goalkeeper mm -hmm. I mean he ended up playing for Croatia so sure. played for Croatia several times yeah. um, what was that like you know having such a mix of players representing. Um, a country um, at their home Olympic Games. Do you think it might not have been difficult for, you know, the home fans to get behind, maybe? Um, you know, I think, like, actually just Soro and Josip Vrlic, they were, they were Brazilian to play. The other ones, like Ives Gonzalez, is from Cuba, but he already have the Brazilian nationality. So I think when you talk about nationalities, it's just, it's a very, very open concept. You know? I think when someone has the right to be a citizen from Brazil, he has the same right of someone who was born there. This is my view. <laughs> so, But there's, it's true that uh, Soro and Joseph Village, they were like, they got a passport to play for Brazil. Uh, and it was pretty, because the coach was Ratko Rudic, so he, it was a really, really big mix. And, uh, and in that moment, the, the sport was very important in, in Brazil. So everybody was following the team, talking about the team. Of, of course, every single interview, they were mentioning like the, the team is not everybody from Brazil, actually born in Brazil. So it was, it was, I, I, in that moment, I've, I, 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 I was obligated to learn how to to approach this situation with the media, with the with the crowd, with everyone. But I think we could give this. Uh, we were like working a lot, training a lot, so we think we could connect it with with the. I mean, the crowd. it's a kind of pressure and scrutiny that you might never have ever had before, and might never ever get again. You know, 
you know, some huge water polo countries, you know, imagine if Serbia or Hungary or Croatia hosted the Olympics, the amount of pressure that would be on those players um, in front of their home fans would be massive. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's there's so much to unpack about Rio, you know, playing in the green pool, you know, <laughs> six, uh, the win over Serbia. Yeah, I've got to bring up the green pool. Um, uh, Radko Rudic, obviously. Um, maybe you'd start with that. What was it like to play under um, uh, a coach with so much prowess? Yeah, I, I like like the situation was those guys in Brazil, if you realize, many of them are not playing in Europe anymore. They stopped to play after the Olympics. So it was a pretty special situation. Like usually when you're preparing to Olympic Games, a long 12 years, 80 years training team to prepare in, 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 in Brazil, in Rio was like two, three years and come on, <laughs> we're going to play the Olympics. So many guys were, they were very brave to, 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 to invest and to invest their time and their energy with, with this project. No, but Radko was like very, very important on that moment. Uh, before it was Goran Sablic from Croatia, and then it was Mirko Blazevic. They were helping to construct this project too. But the point is, when Ratko came with these last three years, he was like three years, and we need to make a team to get a medal. So it was like, whoa, we were training, working. <laughs> but it was funny because I think we have this point, this way of view that when comes a guy with four Olympic gold medals, if he tells you that you need to swim. 20 kilometers, you're going to swim 20 kilometers. It doesn't matter. You know, if he said, like, you need to, whatever you need to do, you do. Because you have this uh, confidence on his, on his, uh, on, on his coach. Yeah. Um, do you feel that, do you feel that Brazil should have medaled at that competition? Because a lot, uh, you know, maybe the hype was too great anyway. But, you know, if you, if you go back and even read on a lot of the articles after, you know, the swimming uh, and water polo and the aquatics in general. And, you know, I, I don't want to talk too much about the state of the Brazilian uh, Swimming Federation, but do, do you feel, honestly, you should have got a medal there? Or do you think, actually, you did as well as was expected? I can tell you that I think it was the best result I ever had in my career. Really? Out of all the competition? Really, because it's like, it's crazy if you think about it like this team was like it, it, like we beat serbia <laughs> it's like of course i would like to get the medal maybe against croatia maybe we were able to beat them but actually like where were brazil before where is brazil now so if you have like a parenthesis of these two three years where we won a world league medal and uh and olympic games we got the quarterfinal so it is crazy if you <laughs> Yeah, um, do you, do you still have an interest in Brazilian water polo? Do you do you follow um, all the you know the, the competitions back there? And um, I guess a follow up to that is: do you think do you think it's taken a step backwards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm always I'm always trying to every year come many Brazilians here in Barcelona. I'm always trying to help them, like to find a club or to see the training sessions or to train with us, like. And uh, after Olympics, like all country, all the country, not just water polo, but got a step back. And it's it's sad because I, I've tried my best, which were on that moment with the Olympics. But after that, it's it's not my job, you know. <laughs> like so, it's difficult. Like it's not my my uh, it's not my job. So it's it's sad, but it's really difficult to to in that in that count in countries like brazil and development countries to to develop a sport and i forgot to tell you about one one project that is still working there in brazil which is amazing social project it's uh it's in bauru and they organize a waba waba and it's, uh, it's a really really amazing project a social project in bauru and sao paulo which called sesi it's like 2000 kids and it's beautiful that from the olympics they keep like using water polo as a tool for social in session for social development of the country yeah that's 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 really good and hopefully they can they can keep that up all the good work they're doing um after 2016 um back to europe did you think after the olympics did you think okay i'm gonna stick with brazil or was it pretty obvious to you that this this has happened it's been a great experience for you know i've learned a lot about it but did, was it a natural evolution for you to 
think actually now I'm going to start playing for Spain again? Actually, when it finished the Olympics, I said I need to rest <laughs> after Radko. <laughs> We were training a lot. It was crazy. <laughs> it was amazing, but uh, it were, were like really, really tough. And thanks, Vieco, we, we, because he take he take care of me. So like, go easy. Like, take time to rest, to recover. <laughs> and uh, but after that, I was said like, I will get an year to see what's going on. So in this year in Brazil, never hap- nothing happened. And in Spain. Uh, David Martin was starting as a coach. I saw that it was a beautiful project. I saw many guys that could be amazing players, and and of course, and I was missing to play on high high level too. So I was I got one year to see what's what's going on in both countries. And as I said before, where Polo allowed you to change again, so why not? Yeah, why not? And when you came back, um, we spoke about it earlier. What? Do you think you got the feeling from some that perhaps, oh, well, he's gone and played for them and now he's come back? He's, you know, how is it? How do we know he's going to be loyal to us? Did you get that kind of feeling? Or did you feel, well, actually, I'm a good enough player to be here and ultimately turn to be the leader of the team and the captain? Like, yeah. You know. Of course, many people don't understand and criticize that. And it's normal. Everyone is free to have his opinion. So, but it's something that I really don't think about it. You know, I'm just. As I told you before, I'm like I'm here at 15 years old, so I have both feelings from Brazil and Spain. I'm not going to the war. I'm not killing anyone. <laughs> it's just like sport, so why not? And uh, and it was it was a, it was nice this comeback here because it was a different situation. It was a young team uh, with Alvaro Granados, Marco Larumbe, Alberto Munares, and. And with some old friends like Dani Pinedo from Fernandez, Blay Mike, and it was beautiful to to start this project and grow with them. And David Martin, which he was my captain in Barceloneta, and uh, he was the coach, so it was like all like a family, you know, <laughs> for me more than Spain. It was like uh, come back to a family. Yeah, you, you've listed off a few players there. Some of those young players are, are really like coming into their own now, um, and I, I guess it's. We, we need to talk about Tokyo a little bit. Um, but even before Tokyo, you know, there was 2018 in Barca where we really saw, you know, that that, that summer was a real, a real, like, I thought it was a, a step um, for the Spanish national team. It's suddenly, they've gone from having good players to really being, you know, one of the best teams in Europe. Um, Tokyo gets postponed. I asked Maddie last week on the podcast, um, what kind of practical impacts that had on you? Um, how how did you how did you feel when when you heard it was being postponed? It was so difficult because we were like six months no three months before we were playing the final of the European Championship in Budapest like eight thousand beautiful people amazing crowd amazing final we lost some penalty shots it was like we were in the moment that we were feeling like. It's arriving in Tokyo, no? And then it, it was not easy. Uh, in Spain, it was one of the countries which were, like, really, really tough. We were at home almost, like, three months. We, we couldn't go out of home. So we were working um, at home. Our coach were sending videos what to do. So it was really, really, really tough moment. Uh, I remember that coming back to my brother when we were playing at home with the couch, I was like throwing the ball on the couch, you know, trying to f- do something to, to, to be prepared. Because the point is that we didn't know that it would be postponed. So it was like, it's going to be Olympic Games? No. It will be cancelled? No. It will be postponed. So it was really, really tough. And we were not playing. We were not doing what we love. So it was a hard time for, for every person. So, athlete. Yeah, yeah. So you've gone from 2016 in front of a home crowd, packed crowd. We won't mention the Green Pool again. You know, the national <laughs> anthem, you know, hundreds and, you know, the atmosphere at Rio, I thought was was incredible through the through the TV set. Yeah. And then you have the eerie silence of Tokyo. Now, at the end of the day, an Olympic Games is an Olympic Games, and I don't think anyone cares necessarily for the, the players anyway. They go and they have an amazing experience. But... <sighs> 
did did you kind of think ah oh, this this isn't really this isn't really the same or, or were you were you still thinking well this is just an unbelievable experience yeah we need to say that the japanese crowd are not so loud so <laughs> it was like if they were there it was not a big difference but anyway but it was it was they love war polo but <laughs> they don't like brazil is like crazy on the crowd <laughs> yeah <laughs> But the, the difficult point was more more than the Olympics was the preparation because we were really scared to get the coronavirus and couldn't play the Olympics. So it was a crazy year because every game in Champions League game you were like control if you are positive you cannot play. Like preparation to Tokyo, one we have like many guys that were getting crazy. <laughs> like we have like example Mike Larumbe and uh, Alejandro Bustos, our friends. They were like wow, they were every day with the mask. They were like closing. They were considering to rent an apartment to stay alone there. It was really, really tough to the preparation. And, of course, when you were playing, we were doing the tests every single day. So we, we were a little bit worried, too. But it's it was, like, almost the same feeling, really. Like, of course, we miss our family to be there to because they were these five years with us. But... Um, when you are playing the Olympics, it's like it's so we are so focused on your games and your uh, and your practice there and your your routine that you even don't think about it over the crowd. I remember speaking to one of the uh, the swimmers at the time, um, and they had the choice. They they obviously limited the number of people for the opening ceremony, but obviously like there are loads of people going. Oh, I'd love to be there, but. You know, you catch COVID at the ceremony. I mean, it's, it's game over from... Yeah. But anyway, let, let's actually talk about Tokyo. You had an outstanding group stage. Yeah. You beat Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro. What was it like when it came to that semi-final game? I actually watched it last night, just to recap. <laughs> um, not, I, I hate to bring it up, but I, I mean, it was such a fascinating game. Um, yeah. You know, you're all elite athletes, and I'm sure that win against Serbia that there was no arrogance or anything but what was it like in that that semi-final you know you've already beaten them you've proved them you can beat them and then they came from behind in the last quarter um what what were you feeling like you know I think sometimes we made a mistake that we try to we have amazing experience and then we have at one moment one bad result and we just like say oh the olympics was all oh, we lost against serbia but i was enjoying like a kid really <laughs> i was like it was amazing we won every single game in the groups we were playing amazing we beat the quarterfinals of course i would like to have the gold medal but we did such amazing olympic games and we lost against serbia it's they are they were the olympic winners in 2016 they are amazing teams of course it can happen it's true that the game was on our hands and this is very very hard, very painful, but it's a sport. They are great players too, and uh, and I think this is cannot throw out all the exp- wh- 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 everything that we experienced in that Olympic Games. You know, for me, it was the first time that I played the semifinals, and uh, even if we lost, the the feeling that the water polo that we were playing, how we were able to, I think everybody would, all the crowd, every all the audience, they were loving the way that we were playing. As I said before, of course, I would like to have the gold medal, but it's a sport, and this is and this is it. We need to keep going. Yeah, I, I was actually in Spain, and I watched that semi-final at the time, and I, I kind of took myself on as an honorary Spaniard, but I, I felt really gutted, gutted to watch it. But that, that you know, some, that last goal from Filipovic, yeah, I mean, it was just, amazing. You know, yeah. sometimes you've just got to say, look, I mean, <laughs> um, yeah. do you think that semi-final loss? Um, carried over to the bronze medal match? Or do you just think, again, it was just a, a, a game in isolation? They, I think they were hungry. We, we've tried. We did, we did everything to didn't carry this to, to the bronze medal, but we did it. Uh, like uh, It's very difficult. But I think Hungarians too. The only problem, like our way of playing in Spain, we need to be 100% focused. We need to have a lot of energy. Like... Hungary, they have much more talent. They are bigger. They have better shooters. They have, they are amazing teams. So to play with them, we need to be a hundred percent focused. And probably we weren't. And it's sad because it was an opportunity to get a bronze medal. But uh, I think we didn't beat Hungary maybe last three, four years. So it's normal that we lose against them. It's, it can happen too. They are a great team too. But uh, the point is, this this semi final was. Coming back to the semifinals, um, it's a, it's a 
I mean, like they were better than us. It's not a critic, nothing about that. But it's very difficult when the game came with a lot of men ups and men down, a lot of exclusions, because actually they are the best in the world on that. Even even with that kind of game, we were we were able to win. But uh, it's forty exclusions, so it's very difficult for us to make our dynamic game with movements, with swimming when it's just men up and men down. But they were the best, and it's not like <laughs> never not an excuse. They they are they were the best last night. I don't know many years, so it's how it was. <laughs> you, you you just say that that just just briefly. Do you think there's too many exclusions in the game at the moment? Do you think that yeah. the referee needs to actually hold his breath a little bit more and not blow a whistle and you know let there be a little bit more freedom? I think it's it's not easy for the referees now because it's difficult because we are trying to make the game more fast with more movement. And uh, and it's uh, in the end it's like a paradox because they they trying to give more uh, more movement to the game, but when they whistle many exclusions, the game is more vertical, so and more static. So I think actually I think it's not a problem of of the referees. I really think it's in my point of view it's a, a question of uh, that we need one two on our game that uh, to do not allow. Too many exclusions on the on the game. Like we, I think it's one thing that we could improve in our sport because I don't know in basketball if you get I don't know four or five falls, you need like to, the the you have a special situation always when you make too many exclusions. No, in our sport they try to control the game with exclusions, but actually what you are doing you are making the game more static. So. It's a, it's a thing that I think we need to, to rethink about in our sport. You, you announced um, a while ago that Barcelona would be where you end your career. Yeah. Um, it's perhaps fitting that that would be the case. You, you haven't been able to stay away for too long. Um, Paris is not far that far away. Do you think that that's maybe something just in the back of your mind? Or, or actually, are you just, just hoping that these next few years or a year or however long it is, while you're still in the game, you're just gonna relax and you know fade away and just enjoy, enjoy and cherish every moment. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying a lot, really. Like I think many players when they get old, they are like, oh, like feel like, oh, I'm so tired. I'm really, really enjoying. I'm enjoying the training session. I'm enjoying the games, and so why not to keep going? I, I actually don't know what will be the limit. Uh, I think like. Uh, it's of course more than Paris, no way. <laughs> but like, uh, I'm really, really enjoying, and I think I've always had that mindset since I was a kid. I think my brother helped me a lot on that. Like, just keep going. It's better when you win to say that you were doing the same. But for me, really, it doesn't matter if you were silver medal, bronze medal, fifth, tenth. It doesn't matter. Like, I like to train in this sport. I like to be play better. I try to to do my best, so why not? Why not? So so we will see you in Paris. Let's see. <laughs> I hope so. It's it's not easy. It's it's a many. You know, like uh, this, this our goalie Danny Pinedo. He's like since he was 31, 32, he said, "No, I go year by year." And now he's forty one, and he was playing like the Olympics. So <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. Well, look, that that's that that's all for now. We're just gonna have a quick break, and we'll be back with um with your questions uh, and a little bit more. Perfect. Okay, well, welcome back to part two, uh, where we put your questions to Felipe. And um, we, we start off uh, from one of your old teammates, Felipe, Javi Garcia. And... Uh, <laughs> He, he asked us to say, please ask him, does he remember why me and my brother called him Michael Jackson? <laughs> because, Do you want to explain this to yeah, the listeners? Yeah, of, course. of course, no problem. It does, not because I was dancing or singing, nothing like that. <laughs> you know, like when I came from Brazil, uh, at that moment, the internet was not so powerful. So the let's say that the fashion way to wear the clothes in Brazil was not like in Europe. So I have like beautiful white socks that I was always wearing. And like, so Chavi Garcia, who was always joking, be like, why are you wearing these white socks? Like with normal clothes. So I always look like Michael Jackson. This is why. <laughs> you can't wear white socks with dark shoes. Really, <laughs> honestly. 
Right, okay, well, there you are. Um, he might be good at water polo, but don't necessarily take his fashion advice, listeners. Yeah. Um, <laughs> enough. Um, anyway, um, next question is from Sandro Sukno. Um, if you're listening, you need to come on the podcast, Sandro. But, um, I think he's been a bit cheeky here, but he says, is there any goalkeepers in the world that you can actually score <laughs> against during training? No, but, you know, I was playing with Sandro in Pro Reco, and uh, I was never a good shooter. I was trying, always trying to shoot, like, with movement. Because I'm, I'm not have a strong shot, I'm not so tall like him, so I was trying to shoot off the hand or trying to move before the shoot. So he was always joking with me because, come on, on that team, can you imagine like we were going to shoot like Filip Filipovic, Tamas Kasas, Sandro Sukno, and myself? Like I will, I try yeah. to <laughs> just pass the ball, just pass the ball exactly. Yeah. <laughs> just like part. applause when, when they shot. <laughs> um, we got one from Vieco. Um, he's also coming on the podcast soon, hopefully. So um, we need to organise that. Um, he's got more of a serious one. It's, do you prefer to play on the right side or centre-back position now when you are no longer dangerous for opposition goalkeepers? Um, do you know, I think I always, I've always tried to, to in my career to adapt and uh, to be useful for the team. I think I never had that kind of ego that I need to be the guy who scores or I need to be like... And, now I think those guys in my team, like Alvar Granados, like Munaris, they are they are amazing shooters. So I'm trying to to adapt to myself for what the coach uh, tells to me. So this is the I'm happy to help the team. So maybe it looks too much humble and like my, but it's it's not really. I'm like really really uh, uh, help to I like to, to to play the way that the coach tells me like with the echo too when I was new he was in the beginning using me like center back sometimes so for me uh, it's good to to help the team just that I'm the, just that I'm the water I'm not too much on the bench which is like a little bit boring <laughs> if you're listening out there take it from Felipe do what your coach says and don't have a ego and play just get in the pool and play it doesn't matter if you're on the wing to start with yeah. um We've got a question here from Mativ underscore uh, WP on the Instagram. Um, advice to become a top water polo player. If you could give maybe one bit of advice. I think uh, I was actually speaking with my brother about that. Like, I think it's it's very important to the only one that I, it's like training the best you can every single day. And this is in a long, in a long run. Long term, we will make you a better player. It's because it's a really tough sport, and uh, every single improvement, it's like you 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 need to to fight for this for this small to for this uh, f- small games to be better. Yeah, exactly. Every every single day, and uh, and it's hard yeah. in our sport because it's it's a tough yeah. sport. <laughs> Speaking of uh, uh, small games. Um, Poor OSV underscore on Instagram says, what is your 100 meter sprint speed? What's your fastest you've ever done? Yeah, 100 yeah, meters. I'm not so speed. I think 55, 55, something like that. It's 55 seconds. So I'm not so, so. I'd be happy with that, to be honest. Yeah, but <laughs> like, I'm not the fast one on my team. Many players are faster than me, so. Yeah, cool. Um, underscore Sigu underscore has said, when will he return to Brazil? Now, I don't know if that's in a playing capacity or, or if that's just a, for a holiday or, <laughs> or something more. But, yeah, just... I mean, obviously, with travel restrictions yeah, at the moment, I was probably not My mom but... was maybe like three years that I didn't come back to Brazil and, like, I need to... I have many family that I miss and many friends, so I try to go there on vacations as soon as I can. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd love to go to... It's raining here today. I'd love to go to Stanley, honestly. <laughs> Um, Magno Polo, uh, also on the Instagram, um, says, how was your transition from amateur to professional pro water polo? Now, do, do, we kind of spoke about it a little bit when you arrived in Spain, but mm-hmm. do you remember thinking, oh, now this is professional and, you know, thinking, oh, well, last week, actually, I was, you know, that wasn't really professional, but this is serious. Do you, do you, do you remember a point when that was? I think it was like the, <laughs> it's funny, but, the, uh, the the importance of the games and the aggressivity on the games, you know, 
And I remember that I spoke with my brother. I said, whoa, here the game is much more tough and much more. And my brother said, look, everybody here is playing to get his money and to bring money home. So it's different way to see the, the game. So when you were playing just because you love to play or when you're playing to, to bring money home. So I think this was one of the moments that I, I felt like this pressure of being a professional. Yeah, if people are getting paid, they're probably going to try a bit harder, I, sh I should suggest. <laughs> um, we've got a few, um, I mean, this one's from Hiji underscore Zalan. Sorry if that pronunciation is terrible. Um, in your opinion, who's the best player in the world right now? And we've got a few others. And we did ask Maddie this last week about uh, her, her dream mm -hmm. seven. So uh, where you, you get to pick a seven and they can be past or present. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to be playing now. We'll start with the first one. Uh, who, in your opinion, is the best player in the world right I now? I think uh, Filip Filipovic. He, not, not just because of the semifinals, but because of the last 10, 12 years that he's top three, top five players in the world. So he's really amazing player. And uh, top seven? This is more, more difficult. <laughs> Dream seven? <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's a lot of players. <laughs> I think uh, goalie. He's going in goal. Yeah, goalie. I think. Uh, I'm trying to really fast thinking. I think uh, Jesus Royan. He was amazing. He who saw the games from Spain in '90s, and uh, it is amazing. His energy. It's a really, really beautiful uh, story. Um, lefties. I would stay with Philip. Filipovic and uh, let's say Tibor Benedek. It's, I, I was he was on that team in Pro Record too, so I was happy to, to play with him. Yeah. On the left side, I should put uh, uh, Manela Siarte, of course. <laughs> of course, yeah. And uh, like to say, to please be more international, and he's my friend too at uh, Tony Azevedo because what he did for American Water Polo is amazing. Um, center yeah. back, maybe I don't know if Tamas Casas and Vlado Vujasinovic. It's a difficult decision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can use Tamas Casas and center forward. I would take to my friends to to Ivan Perez. <laughs> okay, you don't make the team. No, you don't no, get no. This is team. another. No, no, no. This is other. <laughs> I, I, I'm. I was a good. I, I'm still good player, but this is another, <laughs> another level. Okay, if if you say so, if you say so. Um, We've, we've got one here that's slightly different. Um, uh, David underst underscore Rick um, on the Instagram says, what are your future plans beside water polo? Uh, you know, I and mean, we haven't really spoken a bit about this, but, you know, what are your interests outside the sport? This is a big, big issue for us. You know, other sports, let's not say it's soccer, but let's say basketball, handball, People really get money to play. And we, of course, we are professionals, but it's not that you finish World Polo and it's done. And uh, this is really nice in Spain because they help a lot you to study. So I was able to finish my uh, university of business. I did like a, a post-graduation in, in sports management. And actually, I really don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I will try to be connected to the sport because I really love it and I spend all my life with that so to start to work in a bank or something that i don't have this knowledge why why not stay in, in the in the in the environment that i love and what are your interests aside from water polo if it's possible to have any Oof. yeah yeah i have well I, now it's more difficult because i'm more tired after training sessions but i since i was a kid uh my father is a brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt oh nice Actually, now he's red belt because he's like 30 years black belt. So nice, he's like nice, nice. one of masters. So we were always at home. We actually have a dojo. And uh, so I was trying to, he was always trying to show us. And I, I loved to, to practice jiu-jitsu, but it's very, very dangerous to get hurt and to injure for water polo. But I'm always, when I can, I do a little bit of jiu-jitsu. I like to surf too. So we live in Rio in front of the beach. So Copacabana, Leme. Actually, and we as when we waves, I was there. And I, what I'm doing more and more now, it's uh, spare fishing, which is good for me too because not so dangerous to get injury, and and it's good to control your your breath and to. It's like a, an active active med meditation oh, for nice. me. Nice spear fishing. Wow. Okay. Do, you 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 just said about jujitsu there. 
Um, do do you think um, do you think that background helped in any way water polo? You know the you know a lot, a lot, a lot because water polo it's a contact sport. So like the grappling, it's a uh, it's I'm, I'm using a lot and the balance. It's very very, very important. I, I had a funny story when I was a kid. I was like maybe 14 years old, and a Hungarian team came to Brazil to do a training session with with the Brazilians there. And there was a big, big guy, and he held me, and I used like a Brazilian jiu-jitsu. <laughs> oh, nice! And then this guy he was looking to me like I'm gonna kill this kid, <laughs> but I, but he was actually more scared because what did this guy did to me in my arm? <laughs> so I never used this for to water polo anymore. But when I was a kid and I was scared, I said like he grabbed me. I said, oh, let's try to use a little bit of jiu-jitsu now. <laughs> yeah, I write that. I write that a lot. Um, Dragonich underscore six. I think I probably suspect this answer, but um, he says Filipovic or Mandic. Uh, Mandic is amazing too, but Philip, Philip, Philip. All right, Mandic, if you hear that, um, <laughs> not a fan. Um, <laughs> Hanger dot Demeter on the Instagram said, "Which was your favorite competition and why?" You've obviously played it a lot. Um, which which one's your uh, your let's say the European Championship in 2018 with Spain it was amazing because um, I I played for Spanish team before and we never reached like a beautiful great result maybe uh, Rome 2009 but 2018 I was coming back to Spain to the team in Barcelona all the people that were following us all, all our lives so it was beautiful to have the crowd and and the way that we play were, were amazing. Yeah, that's a good shout. Uh, we've got one last one, and it's from Dennis Varga. And he says, can Philip please give me the number of his barber? Ah. <laughs> this is like, uh, I, I'm, maybe he needs to give me that <laughs> to be fat like him and to play like him. It's like amazing. It's uh, it's nice to, to listen that he was <laughs> participating and he's a Amazing player. It's always beautiful to see. I love to see his videos, but it's difficult to... We try to copy him, but it's almost impossible. This is the problem of Dennis. Like, everybody seeing his video and try to copy him. It's no way. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> we look like stupid when we try to copy him. Unbelievable player. Um, well, uh, Felipe, that, that's it. That's it. That's all the questions. Thank you so much for joining us. You've been really, really genuine. English is obviously fantastic. Um, <laughs> I was trying my Thank best. you for joining us. <laughs> You know, no, it's it's absolutely fantastic, and it's great to hear uh, about your career. I really hope uh, I hope the best for the rest of the year. I'm hoping that we see you later on this year in Budapest as well, and and then maybe in Paris. You said that you were. You would be there, so. um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, thanks for taking the time out of your day. And thank um, you, James. Yeah, thank care. you. What what you do in Total World Polo for our community is amazing. It's like it's so important, and if we had more people like you guys it's it's so important for our sport so thank you very much thank you very much thanks and there you have it that was Felipe Peroni and I mean what a lovely guy um, what what a legend uh, you can just tell how much he loves the sport and he's achieved so much and I mean to come over from Brazil to Spain as a 15 year old is absolutely incredible and obviously he's had a fantastic career I really, really love speaking to him and I hope you enjoyed listening as well. Uh, don't forget to go over to Werewolter Polo to get that 10% discount with our discount code PODCAST10. So that's just PODCAST10. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, I look forward to uh, to inviting our next, next guest on uh, next week and we'll announce who that is soon. But thanks for supporting the show and I'll see you next week. Take care.